right, what's going on, all my freaks and geeks out there? We are the Square Roundtable. I want to thank you guys again for joining us, and I really appreciate you guys uh, for checking us out last week and watching our podcast on YouTube and listening to us on Power 214. We really appreciate all of that. Uh, yeah, guys, today is very awesome. We have a really, really, really special guest. Um, this guy today, he wears many hats. He's an artist, a director, and a designer. And one thing that stands out for me, um, and one thing that makes me really appreciate his art, is his overarching theme of trying to change the narrative from what we perceive as um, objective beauty and changing it to more of a subjective uh, self-identity, more uh, inclusive way on looking at what we think is beautiful and just overall changing that whole narrative. And I think it's great. Um, yeah, this guy today comes all the way from London, England. Uh, his name is Ben Ditto. And let's just give him a big, warm round, uh, square round table welcome. Oh, Marcus, your, uh, your thing is off. Okay, cool. All right, Ben, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. It's great to be here and thank you for asking me. It's, um, yeah, it's a nice sunny afternoon in London and thanks for the introduction. That was, um, that was great. Hey man, it's uh, no problem at all. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to start it off light today. Um, because if anybody uh, follows him on Instagram, his Instagram is Ben underscore ditto. And just from looking at your Instagram, the first thing that comes to mind is just like, uh, randomness like it's a lot going on man and I kind of want your insight on what uh what specifically are you trying to come across as like as far as what you post because it's just a little bit of everywhere I want to know is it like uh some sort of motivation behind that or you just like post whatever I have to say that so I'm you know I'm an older guy now and I've been obsessed with images since I was a little kid when I was a kid I'd go to the library all the time and I would just sit there looking at pictures. You know, I, I read books as well, but I was just obsessed with images. So for me, Instagram is like a natural progression where I can just kind of be myself and find the things that are interesting to me and share them. But I have to say, it would, it would be a lie to say that I don't think about it because I really, I do consider kind of, some things just happen naturally and some things I really think about. So obviously, aesthetically I think about is this beautiful to me and I okay. think that's real like for me it has to be either very funny or beautiful mm -hmm. or both <laughs> I do <laughs> um if something's really funny I don't care what it looks like if something makes gotcha. me not it can be ugly as hell um <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, man. but everything else has to be beautiful so even if it's like even if it's something like gore or um you know something violent or whatever it still has to have an element of beauty I don't just like stuff that's kind of um shocking without a, a level of beauty, um, unless it's funny. And then like, I guess I'm, it's, it's really close to my personality, but it's still a persona. You know, I think all of us, when we're online, however much we try to be ourselves, there's still the, like, it's still the ourselves that we're putting out into the world. So, so mm. how I behave with my family or my close friends or whatever will be different to the persona that you see. And I think we're all the same, you know, we all do that to one degree or another. Um, and I just, I like, Technology, fashion, nature, um, humor, sex, like all of these, th and, and politics in the kind of, politics in a broader sense, like I'm super interested in politics, but I try to st sort of have a, not a detached level because we can't be, but I try to sort of see all the sides of everything as well. Um, and also okay. try to have a sense of humor about things, uh, which is really important, you know, if I think if we don't have a sense of humor about things, we can become very like, I'm sure that we are right about everything. And I'm, but personally, I don't think I'm right about anything. Like, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I got you. I have, I have my opinions, but I'm very open to hearing other people's opinions about stuff. And I try to let that come across. Like, it's not like ends viewers right, you know. So, all of that stuff. No, that's, uh, that's really cool. Cause uh, I, I definitely get that from looking at your uh, Instagram. It's very uh, accessible. It's like, okay cool like i know what you do i've seen your body of work and then just like just looking at your stuff i'm like okay that seems like you know something i will post or something you know like a meme that i would like or so and it's definitely yeah. hilarious because uh me and my brother <laughs> me yeah, and my we, brother yeah. will look yeah, we, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, we routinely go through your Instagram. It's hilarious. Like, um, yeah. um one thing I want to ask you about is the uh, the splits challenge. Like, were you able to um complete your split? <laughs> oh man, it's it's been <clears throat> it's been seventy two days of this stuff, and I'm <laughs> I'm like I'm probably about that far from the floor. When I started, I was about that far from the floor. Um, but as we get older, I think we become less flexible. I, but I will do it. I'll achieve it. It's going to take <laughs> another month. <laughs> hey, hey, man, we're rooting for you. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, what'd you say, Ben? Can you guys do the splits, any of you? Oh, no. I can't do yeah. the splits at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say I, I, I can do a split. I probably shouldn't, but yeah, I, I, I can split. <laughs> <laughs> it's precious man i'm gonna split myself yeah. in two there's no <laughs> way i haven't <laughs> i haven't been that low to the ground since i played football in high school man like i haven't done any kind of stretching like that so i know i'm going uh -uh. <laughs> no i mean there's a there's no way but but yeah man on a more um on a more serious note just taking a look at um what you do as far as uh, you being a director and an artist and definitely somebody that I can see has their foot firmly planted in pop culture. I just want to know uh, where it comes from because uh, I've seen, especially with your uh, printing company, Ditto, um, it looks like, for, at least from my perspective, you get a lot of inspiration from the uh, pop art era. Like I can see like a sort of a nod to the Andy Warhols and the Keith Herrings. And it's, and it's, it's really lovely. Like I, I really uh, appreciate it. But I just wanted to know like, what um, is your inspiration for what you do? Like what kind of gets you going, man? Well, <clears throat> when I was, when I, so I grew up in the South of England um, mm. in the really and at the time like I have to say I was obsessed with American culture like my father's a pilot and he would go over to America and bring back bits and pieces but this was before the internet you know we didn't have the internet at all so things like trainers sneakers you know hip-hop um, like Hollywood movies all of, you know robot toys all of this stuff was really exotic so you know they would bring it back to the UK and I was just obsessed with it and I had a real hunger for I guess what things that you would call cool and like the UK at the time, we, I think we were feeding a lot from American culture and I just became, I just became really, really hungry for anything that I thought was cool. Um, so when I was like eight, nine years old, I, for some reason I was wearing trainers with no shoelaces cause that was a thing. And I had like, oh. I had like hair with a center part on, which was like, you can get, you could get expelled for excluded from school for that. And all of these little things that I just, I think I just, also my parents they didn't let us watch tv very much and we definitely weren't like we weren't they wouldn't buy us like you know a nintendo or anything like that so i would see these things that other kids have and think oh that looks so cool i want to be part of it and it made me extra hungry for that kind of culture and then i went to an exhibition about japan when i was i think i was 11 years old and it was like they'd rebuilt tokyo they would built this street of tokyo inside the victoria and albert museum in london and it was so cool it was like this, it was like Blade Runner. Wow. And like, and like um, it, was, it was the most impressive exhibition I ever went to. And then in the gift shop, they had these books of Eroguro, like um, it, it's kind of early manga, but like quite like violent, extreme sort of sex gore manga. And I was mm. 11 years old, 12 years old. And I was just like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's amazing. And I was like <laughs> the combination of like technology, the future, anime, manga, like American culture, all of it kind of came together and just, uh, you know, on top of that being, you know, being interested in fashion and nature and stuff, it all just became, became my thing. And now I guess like in terms of pop art, I think there's a lot, it's all linear, you know, these things, hmm. it sort of goes in a line from th people like Aubrey Beardsley, who was an illustrator in the, he, you know, he had a very short life, but he was like turn of the century illustrator. I loved him. And um, that, kind of illustration style fed into like um like art deco and art nouveau and that fed mm -hmm. in you know kind of it fed into pop art and, and all of these things go on a line and i think i've just always been interested in and, and like any image that catches my eye and i think oh that's really cool it's it doesn't really matter which era it's from but i guess mm -hmm. it always has like it always has a bit of a twist like a dark twist or something something about it that has different levels i guess warhol's stuff was like 
it's more him as a person and the way that he operated. Like if you just see, I love his electric chair prints, you know, they're incredible. But if you just yeah. see them without knowing about him, it doesn't mean so much when you know about him and the way that, you know, the way that he created this culture in the factory and, you know, all, all of this stuff, it suddenly it has a lot more meaning. And I think exactly that if we're working in fashion or music or anything like that, none of it is in a vacuum, you know, we're always within like, within context so i think that everything i like sort of fits within a context or sits within a time and i find all of that really beautiful as well that's that's cool and it's interesting because i actually got a chance to see um some of Andy warhol stuff when they had it down here at the high museum here in um georgia and like he said it's just the most amazing thing to see because you really see him and all of his art, like even down to his sketches and stuff, it was like they had, they had like the little movies he would make from like his studio and all that. So, I think that he, I think that's why he's so important to art because, you know, I I took um, art in school. That was my minor, and film was my major. So, it's really cool to you know get to talk to somebody who I'm like you know like minded. So I appreciate that. He also, um, I think the interesting thing about Warhol is that he used to record everything. Like he used to document everything. He had tape recordings and films and, you know, just this huge archive. Yeah. We've kind of, I think he was like the prototype for what we've all become. You know, I kind of, I mm. document everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've all become very good at it. And it's like, are we doing it for ourselves or for other people? And like some people, you know, they'll do it for themselves and it gives them pleasure and other people it becomes useful for society. And he was like the prototype for that, I think. Yes, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I um, I really like that, um, like that idea of making art that uh, has a meaning for yourself. Because um, I think it bleeds through more because uh, just, I guess, subjectively, and that's with um, visual arts and that's with music. And that's some of the stuff that I got from uh, looking at some of your work, Ben. Um, it gives the uh, viewer or the listener a chance also to not even uh, relate to you, but also to kind of find their own meaning a little bit. So, yeah. And I think when you make something that, uh, cause a, a lot of the times, you know, um, uh, in certain situations, uh, ways that we feel about certain things aren't necessarily too much different than, you know, our neighbor, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I could definitely uh, believe that. And I, you know, understand when looking at somebody's work, you can sort of, I guess, almost feel what they, what they felt when they made it. And it just, I, and I, I like that idea. Like when you make something for you, it definitely comes through more uh, the final product. Oh yeah. I think I think that's something really interesting about meme culture as well. You know, we all share memes. And I think one thing that's been really interesting is like people all over the world kind of relate to the same thing. So yeah. we used to really separate ourselves and say like, okay, because this person's in a different country, they probably feel differently or have different relationships. But now I know that my experience having like a romantic relationship and the ups and downs and difficulties is the same as somebody in China or like Brazil or Japan or wherever, you know, we're all human beings. And I think that the more that culture is kind of distributed through technology, the more we see that we're actually very similar. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We, have, we have like very similar kind of um, problems and joys and whatever in life. And that's the, that's the great thing about technology. But yeah, I think, you know, I have my meaning that I put in and then you can, you can read your own meaning into it. And sometimes that's what I intended and sometimes it isn't. But either way, it's, you know, it's a valuable thing regardless. Do you see what I mean? Oh, no, definitely. I, um, I understand that completely. And with, um, with talking about uh, technology and pretty much the way we view art and just uh, honestly how accessible everything is as far as uh, music and, like I said, visual arts, um, what are, uh, what's your thought process when it comes to uh, tangibility? Because I feel like that's something that in this era now we've kind of tried to pull away from because everything is just so, you know, I can download this, I can stream this instead of like, like having it and holding it. Like, is, do you, like, what are your thoughts on the, I guess, the uh, need for tangibility? Well, I've, I've thought about this so much because I kind of started my career with a printing company. So the print publishing mm -hmm. 
because I really believed in the power of tangibility. And then mm. about five years in, I started another business called Future Artifacts, which is about the future of the object. So it was mm. like, I think I still buy books. I don't buy records. Um, oh, okay. I, the reason that I don't buy records is that I had this huge record collection. It was like a lot of, uh, tons of techno, like goth stuff, uh, jungle, like drum and bass, like all of this stuff and it got stolen. So I had this huge record collection, it got stolen and I was like, you know, I live with this sketchy guy and he stole my record collection, you know, hundreds and hundreds of records. And I was like, that's it. I'm never getting attached to physical things ever again. But okay. then, I, then I kind of built up a few more. I started buying records again. And then I kept moving house and taking these like records. I was like, I'm actually listening to MP3s a lot more. I was like, am I attached to this because of like an emotional nostalgia? Or do I need them? And then I was like, from now on, I'm only going to own stuff that I love. And it's mm. sort of ended up being books. Like I own a lot of books, but if I don't love a book, I'll just give it away to somebody. So I've still got loads and loads of books. Um, and it's because I think that for me, if I own a book, it's like owning a piece of the artist who made it. So not so much literature, more photo books, but right. like, I have one over there by like HR Geiger who designed Alien. And it's a gift from somebody. And it kind of feels like I own a bit of that, of his artwork. Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, oh, yeah. I don't think that's ever going to go away. But people are, people are still buying records, even though there's no need. You know, we don't need them at all. But I think the <laughs> quality is different. Like, if you listen to a record on a cool old record player, it does sound amazing. But I'm like, do I want to sacrifice the sort of um, the convenience? Do I want the convenience of listening to everything on my phone? Or do I want the quality of listening to it with a record player and having this big collection that I have to take everywhere. And for me, it's, I think for all of us, you know, we all kind of, we all kind of draw our own boundaries with that. And like, I still read magazines every day. Like I love magazines, like especially not so much fashion magazines, but more like, you know, science and current affairs and things like that. And for me, like I can read stuff on my phone all day, but it doesn't really, I don't enjoy it. And if I sit there and read a paper magazine, I love it. Like I absolutely love it. And they're still a exactly. big business, you know, like they're, they're still selling a lot of those things. So it's not just, it's not just kind of weird art people like me. I think it's quite a lot of the general population still find that important. And it's maybe it's that if we see something on paper, there's not a light glaring into our brains and sort of hypnotizing us. And, you know, reading something from paper is much more meditative and like I'm able to just connect to the words a lot more without being distracted by other things. And, you know, so I think the world still has a big need for it. And also just as humans, I think that own, owning an object is something very human. It's something that animals don't really do. You know, they, they, can't, they make tools, but they don't get emotionally attached to objects. And it's part of the human experience. I think. Right. Um, yeah. just, to, just to kind of piggyback off of that, I had a, that, that same kind of feeling about objects because with me, it's books and then it's uh, movies. Like if you go into my house right now, I got like a stack of Blu-rays and DVDs of like all my favorite classics. And even though I can go on Netflix or YouTube Plus or my Xbox and just watch them digitally, it's something about having that copy, you know, just the, like the fact, you know, putting it into the, you know, Blu-ray or whatever, whatever you use and getting the loading screen up to choose the title and all that. It's, it's like you said, that nostalgia. Sometimes it just brings you back. Like with me, when I do my writing, a lot of people are like, man, why you got those notebooks and stuff? You always write it. You could just do it on your laptop. But I'm like, it's something about, you know, that paper and that pen. And, you know, when I write, you know, I get to see my own handwriting, my style, you know. So it's it's really, you know, the technology is great now that we use because it could get us, you know, to certain places we couldn't before. But sometimes it's just good to have that good old, you know, old time you know right here in my hand and i get to look at it physically so i totally agree with that completely i think with especially with handwriting i think that there's something in the kind of connection from your brain to your hand to the mark that you make mm -hmm. and like, it's cathartic and i think if for example i'm right if i mean i'm not a big diary writer but if i'm having a difficult time with something i might write about it to help me to kind of clear my mind and doing it as like a note on my phone or on my computer, it won't have the same effect. And just the, the sort of therapeutic thing of sitting there and, and doing this, I guess like 
it's something that goes right back to when we're like ch tiny children you know we we start drawing when we're little kids and i think um it just it sort of reminds us of that connection between our body and the you know do you know what i mean but that, mm -hmm. I definitely do. I definitely do. Yeah, right. And like you say, it's not like that's not to say that technology is bad, but it's like they have. I think we've had the we've had smartphones for like eleven years now, and I think we're starting to sort of understand what they're good for and what they're not good for. You know, exactly. like it's really great for connections, and it's great for efficiency, and it's great for organizing and map reading and blah blah blah. But it's not good for you know true human connections or kind of some of these more kind of meditative things but i you know it's i think with it's such an early technology as well like 11 years is nothing imagine like the connection that we're going to have to this in 50 years it'll be so integrated and you know so different yeah um and i feel uh, i feel the same exact way like i don't um I don't necessarily uh, hate technology or whatever. I do realize there are some good aspects and some bad aspects. Like, like when you think about it, just e how as far as we've come right now, like it's you know it's mind blowing. Like I'm able to look at you at a different time on the other side of the world. You know what I'm saying? And we're <laughs> able to converse. You know, and it's it, that part of it is great. But uh, I do agree with you because I'm I'm an avid um, a record collector myself. So I have, and amongst other things like books, um, I'm huge on anime. Like I just, I love um, art and I love aesthetic. And I feel like definitely with technology and the way we're able to view things like, like uh, you have Kindle, you have books that you can read online, but you just lose it. You know, you lose the cover art, you know, you lose the texture, you lose the, uh, the beauty of it, which uh, is, why I love things like records, you get to open it, and you know, read uh, the artist notes on the back, just certain things like that, that you don't get to do when you download a song, you know, like, that's just some of the stuff that, uh, that, that I feel that goes along with just the aesthetic of having something tangible. But I wanted to ask you, like, how does that uh, affect your businesses like that? Um, the rapid change of technology like did that affect uh ditto or did it um make you go into dazed beauty a little differently like how how did that affect you going forward with your businesses <clears throat> completely yeah i think <clears throat> so me starting ditto as a print company was basically uh, uh, it was a perfect illustration of how not to start a business you know i started that <laughs> business i started it during the credit crunch um, a, a time when printing was becoming, you know, the print industry was dying and paper, you know, paper manufacturers were um, all going out of business. And I just thought like, I thought it would be, you know, a way of kind of surfing a kind of zeitgeist moment and being like, okay, well, all of this is dying, but we'll be the people kind of promoting tangible objects. Mm -hmm. And to an extent it worked, but it was really, really a terrible idea for a business. So um, I, I worked very, very hard for a long time. We made very little profit. Um, but it was successful in like, we made lots of beautiful things. Um, so it depends how you're measuring success. But then I guess at some point I was like, I'm working very, very hard to make all of these physical objects and printing is a hard, it's a difficult business, even if you're like in, in the best of times. Um, and I was like, I can, am I, am I being a Luddite? Do you know, you know, like, am I being somebody who is trying to go against technology. And then I started to be like, actually, I love technology. I'm gonna try and embrace them both. So every project that we printed, we had a digital version of it as well. So we would release kind of, you know, um, we would have films that went with books and fonts and kind of interactive experiences and stuff and tried to kind of marry the technology and the, and the physicality. And then after about seven or eight years of printing, I was like, this is it's just too much. It, the stress became too much and I stopped printing completely. Um, and started just focusing on kind of more digital media. But we still, you know, I still publish books. I use different yeah. printers. Um, but then when we started Days Beauty, so I was brought on to Days Beauty as the art director. Um, and it was already a part of Days, which is a very established thing. And we printed one issue, issue zero. But I think it was very much kind of in the publisher, Jefferson, I think it was very much in his um, plan that it was going to be mostly a digital thing. And I think that for something that was so futuristic, you know, Days Beauty was so much embracing the future, but the print thing was, the print magazine that we made was still a very important and interesting part of it. And I don't regret that at all. I think like 
does it need to be a print magazine? Probably not. But did having that printed manifesto help? Definitely. Because if you pay, like, if you make a statement and you invest in printing it on some paper and distributing it, you're, you're really saying something. You're saying, like, I really believe in this idea. If I just tweet something, I can tweet the same thing. It takes me five seconds and costs me nothing. And it doesn't really <laughs> any statement of commitment at all. Do you know what I mean? So no, right, definitely. I think like there are all of these things, like the sort of emotion of tangibility and the commitment and the sort of um, you know the the interplay of technology and physicality. And I think that all of them we're thinking about them all the time. You know, it's it's like a constant conversation. And I don't think there's no, there was a big thing for a long time where people were saying print is dead. You know, print's dead. And it's this like well, it's not dead because some bits of it are going to evolve and some bits of it are going to die. And that's like a natural evolution, but it's not dead. It's just changing, you know? Um, mm. So yeah, I'm, I, I, it was also a bit weird of me to start a print company because I love publishing, but I love technology and I've been kind of doing stuff with like hacky bits of coding and, you know, bits of software and stuff since I was a kid, you know, since I had a 48 K spectrum in like 1988 and I've, been in, interested in all of that stuff since then so it's like i think i shut down a bit of my brain i was like i'm just going to focus on physicality and i kind of i it was really nice to fall back in love with the technology as well which i love you know i absolutely love that stuff all right and um um and piggybacking off of that ben um i wanted to ask you um, in television do you prefer like uh, cgi renditions or live action renditions of a uh, source material it's so kind of <clears throat> when I watch like I love horror films from the 1980s so they were, they were so imaginative you know they had like really really amazing creature effects and especially you know all of the special effects were incredible and even if if you watch them now even if they're quite bad you still kind of wanted to believe them so it didn't matter if the monster was like you know if the mo if the monster was kind of, you could really tell that it wasn't a real monster so because you it's like theater you want to believe it so it, it's fine now with cgi sometimes i watch like you know wh whatever the latest thing is and it's absolutely perfect like it's incredible and it's perfect and i could i think they're kind of both good but for different reasons so i don't think like i don't prefer cgi or prefer live action i think that they're like two different art forms i guess it's like saying do you prefer painting or sculpture do you know what i mean like yes. CGI is an art form um and like I absolutely, there's a guy called Brian Yersner who did a film called Society and he did lots of the sort of creature effects in the 1980s and his stuff is like, it's mind blowing. And like, even if I saw it today, I'd be like, it's, it's so amazing. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't also have some CGI with that as well. You know, you can combine those things now. So I'm not like a, I'm not like a hardcore CGI person or a hardcore live action person. I'm like a, yeah, mix it, mix it up and, and use what's appropriate. Definitely. That's that's a good balance to have always because you gotta appreciate both art forms because either way it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of people to get that stuff to you know come out the way it does on screen because they have to go by a lot of you know itineraries to get you know did the lighting right if it hits from this side like with CGI and if it's practical you know make sure it's part of the face is at the right, you know, centimeter. It, you know, it just takes a lot of work. So it's something you can appreciate for both, like you said, Ben. And I I love practical just a little bit more because I'm a big, like, Star Wars, like George Lucas. So when the thought that he could do all that back then, and especially, like, with Alien, like, how they could make those practical effects seem so real and how it could still stand up today is what, you know, I appreciate. But like you said, I love CGI because now we can do things that we couldn't do before and, you know, have these like certain realities and the de-aging of people who are like 80 and you can make them look like they're 30 again. So it's, like you said, it's, it's fun to see both of them come out and play, you know. It's amazing. And I think that there's something really important about this, which is that if you make a CGI scene perfect, people can't really tell that what's happened. They can't really see the work. But if you craft some monster or an alien or a spaceship and you really make it, whoever's watching it can see, whoa, that's that's like an amazing amount of work. How did they do that? So there's kind of a wow factor in like, you know, alien, for example, it's it's so amazing. 
I like like you, you know, I grew up on Star Wars and like I remember thinking like somebody actually made that. Like somebody made that spaceship or or they made that whatever it is, that monster on that planet. And for me, you know, if you did that with CGI, it would have to be absolutely perfect. And even then, I think in my brain, I wouldn't be thinking like, whoa, how did they do that? I'd be like, well, they did it with CGI. You know, just, yeah, sure. just not yeah. CGI, you know. <laughs> I think like with live action stuff, there's an element of artistry to it that's like, it's like be- amazing sculpture, you know. So I, I right. guess I'm with you on that one. Yeah, and, and interesting enough, you know, it fits into that same argument about, um, uh, technology and the lack of tangibility because the especially in horror films like the thing I used to love and I still love about it um, when those uh, monsters or those creatures were made whether they were a uh, guy in a costume or a puppet or stop motion it psychologically uh, at least for me and emotionally I felt it more because I'm like oh wow you know that thing is actually there you know, it's not like a uh, a rendering that was made in post, you know, and <laughs> an actor that's kind of miming something now. No, this this thing was like at, you know, at some point made by somebody and it's, you know, it's actually tangible. You can reach out and touch, it, you know. So, yeah. So I, I definitely agree with you on that. But I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the sort of marriage of an album to I guess the visuals that were put into it because uh, me and my brother like we're huge uh, 1975 fans and we love the album uh, Notes on a Conditional Form and I, I really wanted to know what that process was like for you commissioning uh, these artists to add visuals to uh, these songs on the album like what would from the beginning to what we got and what we saw because uh, i watched i watched all of them they're amazing i just wanted to know for you what was that process like hand picking all of these artists hmm. <clears throat> so i think the the way it started is that we ha- um the album was finished and they the, the guys have been working on the album for a long time <clears throat> a very long time and in that time, we, you know, I directed a couple of the videos and I directed one of the videos from the previous album. And, um, and when, we, when they'd finished this album, we were talking with the record label with Dirty Hit and we were sort of thinking, what could we do? To, this was during lockdown as well. So they were saying, what could we do to kind of give the audience um, like a visual feast here that's kind of, that goes beyond simple visualizers and lyric videos. And, uh, you know, we were on this call and I just had this idea, like, why don't we just do an art exhibition and try to kind of introduce a new audience to some, I wouldn't say they're not complicated ideas, but I think new ideas or new ways of looking at the world. And Mm. I think the interesting thing with the 1975 is that they have this very big, diverse audience. And there are people, you know, from people like, you know, from yourselves to kind of old ladies in the UK to young, you know, kid like teenagers in Japan or whatever, you know, they just have this really diverse audience. And I think the joy of kind of, it's a bit similar to Day's Beauty and that Day's Beauty was kind of bringing new ways of thinking to a very, very kind of, a very kind of predictable industry. Like the beauty industry is very predictable and it was very kind of rigid. And I mm. think with pop, you know, I think that 1975, I wouldn't call it pop music, but it's definitely like within broad pop culture and like, you know, popular right. culture. Um, I think there's a way that people expect you to talk about things or expect you to visualize things. So I think that's like having the opportunity to be like, here's a completely radical way of viewing this um, that might be nothing you'd ever, nothing you'd ever expected. And also like taking the band to a kind of new level of maturity and credibility, like they, they are very credible and very like well recognized and well loved. But like now that they're so established, they have the opportunity to kind of take risks that maybe they couldn't have taken a year or two ago. And do you know what I mean? Because they have such a kind of big, like supportive audience. Um, So if you're a new band trying to become like mega successful, maybe you wouldn't take that risk. But because they've had like, this is, you know, every album they've had has gone to number one. So they feel like they can be a bit more adventurous now. Um, And that gave me the opportunity. I I sort of, it's quite boring. Like I started off by just doing a ton of research of, you know, there are artists who I like, like Frederick Paxton. Um, he did the North Korea video. I've been Mm. a fan of his for a long time. And I was like, you know, he, he came to my head immediately. I wanted it to be about 
I wanted a lot of it to be about technology and a lot of it to be about a future way of looking at the world. But with him, for example, it's not, there's nothing technologically unusual about it, but it's talking about human beings. Like it's filming these humans in this very authoritarian situation, all being different. You know, if you look at it from far away, they all look the same. And if you look at it close up, they're humans. And right. I think this is like, it didn't, but there was no, there's no robots in there. There's no AI or anything like that. But I think it's a very current thing to think about. You know, we're kind of seeing authoritarianism kind of on the rise in bits of the world. And I think that for us to see like, you know, to, to sort of reinforce a message about humanity was good. But also it's beautiful. You know, his, his film is beautiful. So even if you don't understand it at all, it still looks cool. And then um, I basically made a bit, I made a big list of artists who I liked. And then I started to think I want it to be different to, I want it, I wanted to not work with people I've worked with previously. So okay. like an easy thing would be like, you know, I've worked with the, all of these people on Dazed or on, you know, through Ditto, but I kind of set myself like a, I'm going to try not to work with anyone I've worked with before. And then I wanted it to be a diverse range of people. So not just diverse, like, you know, in terms of gender and race, but diverse in terms of like geographic location and ways of thinking and ways of producing media. And, you know, just try and be like, as kind of, you know, try and cover as broad an area of thinking as possible. And then we were also thinking like, who has art world credibility? Like who, to be, to be a successful artist now, I think you, you know, you need to go through, you see people sort of operate in the gallery system and they, they sort of prove themselves a bit. And I kind of wanted people who had kind of done some of that grafting and done some of that hard work to be like a recognized artist. And, um, you know, some of those people are very young and they've, some of them like, you know, Demon Sanctuary, David, who you spoke to last week, I've been following him, him on Instagram for a while. And I just think he's amazing. Like his of looking at artificial intelligence and uh, aesthetics is beautiful. And like, he hasn't been part of, you know, he's not part of the art world that I know. But it's so good. It doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? So there are people who, like Lu Yang, um, right. she's, like, she's like a very, he's a, a very um, established artist, but um, has never kind of been in contact with pop culture like this before. So I think it's, <clears throat> I just kind of tried to cover as many different, and then some people we asked and they were too busy. And some people we asked and they didn't have enough time. You know, it was like a very quick turnaround, like two, three weeks to make these oh, films. Okay. So we really like, it was really, really quick. Um, everybody was excited to take part, but some people were like, oh, because I'm on lockdown, I can't access my equipment, so I can't do what I'd want to do. So like, yeah. we asked two or three people who I love, but they were like, because I'm stuck in my house, I can't do something I'd be proud of. So I'm going to have to pass. Right, uh, naturally, yeah. And then through that, I just kind of tried to with with every different artist i'd have a conversation and with some of them like ida the um the the cyborg the the artist cyborg i was much more involved with that film than some of the others because they needed they they sort of i helped with the production of that and kind of getting it edited and we talked about that a lot more some some other people i literally said here's the song and then three weeks later they come back and say here's the film <laughs> <laughs> but because nobody really nobody shocked me nobody kind of did anything that I was like well where did that come from because all of these artists they built up their practice over time and they're not they're not going to suddenly do something completely different so it was kind of predictable in a good way do you know what I mean they were, they were sort of yeah. they were doing their thing using the 1975 music as an inspiration and um yeah I think like for me having seen the whole process I was really super proud of all of them and like then seeing how it came across with the, with the audience like some of their fans hated some of them, you know, some of them loved them. But, you know, if you're talking to that many people, you can't be everyone all the time. So it's like, well, I, if I'm proud of the project and the artists are proud of it and the band like it, that's fine. You know, even, even, if, right. <laughs> even if loads of people hate it, it doesn't matter. You know? Because I think if you try to do something that makes everybody happy, you end up being very diluted and it's, it's boring, you know, so. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go. Oh, you, uh, I disagree. You can go ahead. Okay, yeah, I was, I was just gonna say like, for like your inspiration as far as like coming up with the idea of, I think it was the video I watched was a uh, happy birthday. I can't remember the exact name, but birthday it gave, birthday. yeah, it gave me like this feel from like the kind of late '90s, early 2000s, like um, 
I know one of the videos was the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the uh, Californication. It gave me like a Californication, like, you know, gorillas, you know, like that late, like techno, you know, <clears> kind of <throat> outer space sci-fi, like CGI. Like it, it gave me those kind of feels and like, it took me like back, but it felt like it was present. So it, I love when like that mixture and I just wanted to know like, what was like your inspiration for that when you know, going through your creative process. So <clears throat> the, the way that that started, I had, I had lunch with Matty and Jamie, who's their manager. And, and we were just kind of talk, we were just throwing ideas around. And the original idea for the birthday party was what would it look like if we did Sergeant Pepper, the Beatles, Sergeant Pepper. Yes. Uh -huh. like. So that was the kind of, uh, and originally what was going to happen is we were going to 3D scan lots of celebrities and get their heads and make like a kind of a dance performance piece in a party. And then Matty and I were talking like a couple of weeks later, I was sort of developing the treatment. And I went to see Matty at the recording studio and he said, do you know what, if, if somebody remade Sergeant Pepper now, the, it wouldn't be celebrities, it would be people from Vine and meme culture and people from Reddit and 4chan and like, that's the culture now. It's not like, you know, it, it's boring to, for it to be like Beyonce and whoever, whoever else. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had this kind of idea, I think the idea all along was to turn the band into avatars. So, you know, to, to do a kind of like, to basically make avatar versions of them as like a meta thing. And then we thought like, what would be really, really meta is if he was in a digital detox. So he's gone there to deal with his phone addiction and there's no, nobody's got any technology. Nobody has any phones or anything like no Kindles, no anything, no iPads, but everybody is digital. So everything comes from digital culture or, you know, all of the characters, they're not real characters. They're all from the digital world. So it just became this kind of like paradoxical contradictory thing. And it's saying all this stuff about, um, I think that the meaning of it, the stuff that Matty and I are both interested in, for sure. Like we have some, some very like, some very shared interests in like, things like incel culture and, you know, 4chan, stuff like that. Like what happens to people when they feel like they're not being listened to? And what happens to people when they feel like they have no intimacy? And, you know, especially for men, I think like, I don't want to be kind of too gender specific about this, but you know, we're, we're guys and like, I think that, you know, you see a lot of people, especially online, who feel like they don't have a voice anymore. And they, they go into these really dark bits of the internet and find mm -hmm. each other and find this community. And it's not necessarily healthy at all. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's really mm -hmm. not healthy. It's what happens when people, and I'm not blaming anyone or saying it's anyone's fault. It's just kind of what's happened is like, you end up with these strange bits of the internet where people get together to feel like, a, to feel like they belong. And they do some some strange and sometimes very bad things <laughs> do you know what i mean but yeah. it's all because they don't feel like they belong to society and actually i think all all that all of us want really as humans is to feel part of you know we want to just feel part of something we want to have friends and we want to feel you know loved and cared for and and you know that's kind of what the video is about as well it's like it's about um in quite a poppy way you know it's it's about kind of the irony of all of these people like Wojak and Pepe and stuff like that, what happens when those people, you know, when they kind of find each other and they go and digitally detox and they kind of do some yoga and, <laughs> and whatever else. And, and then they're all happy at the end. And it's like, you know, it's about narcissism and it's about kind of identity and all of those things. You know, Matty meets himself in a reflection in a the, in the lake and that's like um, Narcissus falling in love with his own reflection in the, in the mythology. And um, all of these little things, thing is, even if you don't understand any of that, I think we just wanted to, to make something that was fun to watch. So even if none of that makes any sense to people, it's still like some cool dances and some weird characters and some, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It still does something. And um, another question I have for you, um, Ben, was uh, how does a generative adversary network work? Like how does GAN work? So <clears throat> I'm, not really a, I'm not really a programmer, I work with them, but what it does is if you, you get something called a data set. So for example, if we wanted to train a GAN on, say for example, um, uh, like statues from the Renaissance, we might mm. get a, as many as possible, say like 
a thousand up to five thousand images of statues from the Renaissance, and then we can train this date. We can train this computer. We can show it this thing and say, you know, this is the head. This is the fact it's made of marble. This is roughly the size. And if you show it enough, it will learn what that thing is. So, you know, if I show you like a thousand cats, they all look different, but eventually you'll learn, okay, a cat has two ears and whiskers and a tail. But what makes it not a dog is that its ears are a different shape and it's a different like size ratio. So if I wanted to train a machine to know the difference between a cat and a dog, I can train it to know what a cat is, but then it starts to really understand what things are by knowing the difference between it and something similar. So like, yeah, this has four legs and ears and whiskers and stuff, but it's not a cat, it's a dog. What a generative ad adversarial network does is it then tries to draw its own thing. So it would try to draw a statue. And then it also has a thing called a dis discriminator, which is another part of the software, which will look at it like we would look at it and say, well, that doesn't actually look like a statue mm. because you know it's not made of marble or the proportions are wrong or the head's too big so <clears throat> it's kind of creating and discriminating at the same time you know it's generating images and it's also saying okay this one can come through because it looks like a statue this one can't come through. and what you're seeing when you when you watch like when you watch gan films is some it's the process of something trying to draw and pass something that looks like a thing so it could be a flower it could be a cat it could be a marble sculpture or a house or whatever but you set the parameters you train it and then it says yes no yes no yes no yes no and all of the fluidity is it trying to pass stuff through a discriminator yeah, so okay. yeah it's like um i think it's stuff that we do in our brains automatically you know we, we all kind of do this stuff all the time like i'm if i ask you to visualize a dog you will draw one in your head and the thing that makes your brain think, okay, it's not a cat, is all of the things that we know make it a dog. So it gets quite philosophical. You know, this is like, there is some philosophy inherent in artificial intelligence, but a lot of it we take for granted, like the way that we experience things and the way that we perceive the difference between objects and, and animals and stuff like that. Some of it, like, we just grow up doing it naturally, but if you get a machine to do it, you have to train it. So you have to implant some of that philosophy into it. And with a GAN, the philosophy is, you know, trying to recognize difference and then passing it as yes or no, which we do naturally. Right. It's like GAN is a baby. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> totally. I think the interesting thing philosophically with babies is we don't know when we're born, we don't know how much of the information we already have in our heads. So like some people will dream about forests, even if they've never been to a forest. If you have people in some parts of the world that have never heard of certain things, they're still kind of born with that knowledge in their brains. And we, we, we you know, we don't understand how that stuff happens. Like when I was born, did I have any awareness of anything or did it all get learned through experience? And that's something that like, we're just finding out about but yeah you're right it's that's what we're doing with machines now yeah it's interesting no it is it's uh it's, it's completely interesting um and i wanted to know how much of that is used um for like i wanted to talk about your like augmented reality and like what all you're doing with that like it's, uh, for, for is that used in your uh in dazed beauty a lot more yeah, I mean, we, so my contact with augmented reality has mostly been through things like face filters. And um, oh. very early on, so before face filters were really available on Instagram, that's when we started work on Dave Beauty. So it was very early days of face filters. There's a program called Spark, which is how all of those filters are made. And now you can use it, like anyone can use it. But at the time, it was all in its sort of early stages. And we made a GAN that it drew different makeup, like eye makeup looks, and That's then we cool. spark to kind of apply them to people. So we did a project with Kylie Jenner, where we built her a makeup look and a hair look using GAN, and then we worked with Spark to make a thing that used those looks to put them onto anyone. And this was like, you know, it was a couple of years ago now, so it was quite early on. Um, mm. But then what happened is like, I don't know if you know this, but there are all these restrictions now on augmented reality. Like if you can't have anything that looks like plastic surgery. So if you have anything oh. that makes your kind of cheekbones look higher or your lips look fuller or anything like that, um, they see it as dangerous to young people, for example, because it gives them, oh. like, like, you know what I mean? It gives them unachievable standards of beauty. Right. 
approach. We were, <clears throat> we were kind of running a beauty magazine and talking about identity and the future of identity while Facebook and Instagram were kind of trying to police it from a mental health point of view. Do you see what I mean? And then at the same time, I also start, I did a project with the 1975. We did a video called People and lots of that uses augmented reality, but it's kind of in a more dystopian way. So it was taking influence from China and the way that they, um, I don't know if you know this, but they have like morality scoring and they have a citizen index. And like, if you, for example, jaywalk in China, there is technology that will recognize your face and it will automatically register with a central database that you've broken the law and you get this kind of morality index and it's quite like it's like the levels of surveillance and the levels of kind of of what this is doing to society are really like it's fascinating and terrifying but we then took some of the way that that works and used them for aesthetic reasons so like you know to to kind of we made one we were thinking like I guess in the future, if we don't want to be recognized by security cameras, by CCTV, you can cover your face or you could have something where your eyes appear in different places. Do you know what I mean? Like if I wanted to post an image of myself on the internet and have it not be recognized as me, I can just move the eyes very slightly and then mm. recognition software can't recognize me anymore. So we made a filter that just sort of slightly moves bits of your face around so that, so that you can't be traced. And we made a thing that kind of maps your facial points like Chinese security um, CCTV does and all of these things were like talking about I guess it was talking about kind of current affairs but in a very aesthetic pop culture way and when you watch it you just think oh you know it's cool like AR stuff, right. AR stuff is happening but that's where right. all, that's where it all comes from you know oh wow that's uh, that's actually pretty cool because I didn't um, I didn't get a lot of that like I said when you were watching it you just kind of look at it like oh wow it's like a bunch of stuff like everywhere <laughs> and it's like it's, it's, it's like aesthetically uh, pretty but I had no idea uh, where it came from but that idea of uh, I guess is is it like a merit-based like policing kind of like is there how does what's that whole process like that's that's crazy I didn't know about that at all it's a bit like a credit score. So, you know, <clears throat> we have credit scores in the UK, for example. So like if I, you know, if I default on my mortgage payment or I don't pay my credit card, my credit score goes down and I can't then get another mortgage or something like that. So it's similar to that, um, but the state has far more control. It's far more authoritarian. Um, and they, they will, you know, things like crimes that you've committed or your credit score, it all goes together into, a, into an index. And um, that's what the state uses to kind of monitor people. And I think that to be fair to China, we kind of do that to ourselves. So, you know, we're all on social media and we're letting Mark Zuckerberg do it for, for you know, he's doing it for the government. You know what I mean, it's like, right, right. I, I, can, I can complain about, I can sort of look over at China and Hong Kong and say what's bad that they're doing there. But actually we're doing very similar things here, but we're letting tech companies rule us. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's not the government so much as these unaccountable tech companies, which in, in a way is even, you know, it's kind of scary in a different way. Yes. No, uh, uh, definitely. Uh, just the way of, of looking at it, because you don't even realize just stuff uh, as like we were talking about um, how technology or the positives and negatives of, tech, of technology when talking about our cell phones. And like I, I noticed uh, little stuff like I might buy something and then in the next second, I log on to my social media right. and I see. Right there. Oh, yeah, yeah talk see. about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Talk yeah. about yeah. it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's like, oh, all these things for, you know, whatever you just talked about on the phone with somebody. I'm like, really? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and, and another thing about that is, um, have you noticed, like, if you go on a, like a, a, like a, like a website where you can buy clothes or something and you put that clothing in your cart? and you never check out, like they'll actually send a notification to your phone telling you to remember to buy it. It's crazy. <laughs> it's <clears throat> all of that stuff. <clears throat> There's all of these things going on. What, what people don't realize so much is that, that, for example, the pricing of air tickets is dependent on the type of phone that you're using and where you're, where you're using it. So if you're in an expensive bit of London, and you go to buy an air ticket through, a, through certain apps, it knows that you're in like Mayfair, like Mayfair is a rich area of London, it will charge you a bit more for the air ticket. It also knows what type of phone you have. So if you have like a, 
like a third hand Samsung, very old Galaxy, it will mm -hmm. give you a cheaper air ticket. If you're using an iPhone 11 Pro brand new thing, the price of the air ticket will be higher. And they're using all of these things like proximity as well. Like if I sit next to you and you know, I, I keep meeting you and I, it knows that you buy a certain thing, it will then try to advertise me that thing just because we've been close to each other repeatedly. Like all of this stuff, all these tools people are using to sell us things without us knowing. And like, sometimes I'll say like, oh, you know, I, I miss Burger King. And I'll get a Burger King ad, but. Exactly. So that's awful, you know, for people that are like trying to lose weight, you know, I'm not trying to, <laughs> you know, you keep advertising pizza. I'm not trying to eat like that, you know, but so, so yeah, it, it gets a little crazy. And um, I wanted to ask also, because I saw, um, I guess just like aesthetically speaking, a lot of the uh, imagery and the style, the stylistic uh, fashion that the, um, the promotion was made for like these two songs. Like I wanted to know what was your thought process also going into, um, I want to say it's uh, I, I Love America. And I like I, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so what was your process going into that? So I Like America was, the, w the way that I started working with the 1975 is because um, it's mostly because of content. So um, I think that the guys and their manager, you know, Matty and, and Jamie, sort of, they liked the way that I approached Instagram, for example, like the, the amount of stuff I was putting out and kind of how it reflected the world. And I like America. I work with a guy called John Emily, who's a CGI director. And he and I just wanted to make something that was about we were talking about modernism and about how, what would be the equivalent now? So, you know, taking these geometric forms and shapes and colors and text and the way that the modernists work with them. If that happened now in, it was actually 2019, 2018 when that came out, but we mm -hmm. were thinking like, we can all be kind of surfaces for content now. Do you know what I mean? Like there's no reason why like, content doesn't just have to be on a screen it can be wrapped around everything and it can be architectural and you know not just words but like emotions and images and film it doesn't it's not restrained by a two-dimensional screen so that was the conversation the conversation was like how do we sort of show this chaotic kind of modernist surfaces as a container for content type of ethos it's like you know hyper ridiculous neo-modernism kind of thing and combining architecture with architecture with typography with you know image you know image manipulation and all of it and it was meant to just be a trip through that so like it's what we really wanted to achieve was this is kind of what it feels like to be in the internet now like this is what it feels like to log on you're like you know there's stuff happening all around you and like I think I'm in my physical space now so I'm in a room but when I'm on the internet, I'm inside a digital space and that digital space, it doesn't, it's not really, it doesn't really have architecture, but I think it has psychological architecture. Do you know what I mean? Like the way that I kind of navigate through things and, you know, the sort of emotions it creates, it's like being in a building that you can't draw. So that was the, that was the idea for I Like America, just like a, mm. a sort of, you know, how does it feel to be on the internet in 2018? Wow. Um, yeah, because that that really comes across. And I think it's um, I think it's really interesting, you know, when you get to see kind of um, the engineers and the, you know, the man behind the magic and all of that kind of stuff, because uh, definitely I watched the video and uh, I've been to uh, their concerts, too. And uh, especially when they perform I Like America, the, you know, the stage and all of that, it kind of you know, and the uh, the shapes that they have, and you can see the typography on the, you know, it just all comes through. It is, it's really cool. Like, you, you know, you guys did a wonderful job with that. It's, it's awesome. It's a really, um, it's a really fun experience as well, because like, also having the opportunity to work with something that size. And like, I've been to a few of the concerts because, you know, we've made, we've made, we've sort of designed the content for the stage show for a, a few of the tracks now, like People, Birthday Party, Greta Thunberg, I Like America. Mm -hmm. And to see it at that stage and be like, oh, kind of, we made this thing to be within and now we're kind of within it. Like, and, and there's all these like 20,000 people who are also inside it. It's like, it's nice to watch stuff on YouTube, but it's really nice to watch it with a ton of other people inside a space like that. It, it feels so much, it feels so good. Do you know what I mean? 
No, yeah, that's got to be a great feeling to just uh, sit and sort of uh, see people react live to, you know, what you put so much work into. Like, that's that's got to be an amazing feeling. It's a, it's a buzz. And normally, like, there's a guy called Tobias Rylander who designed the whole stage show. He's an amazing lighting designer. And, like, okay. we'll, uh, there's, like, um, the front of house, which is where the mixing desks and everything are. We'll stand there. And it's, it, I have to say, it's one of the best feelings I've ever had is to just stand there and see all of this. Like, you know, sometimes it's like a year of work or six months of work and just see all these people appreciating it. It's like, yeah, it feels amazing. I have to say, it's, it's so much better than doing stuff for Instagram or doing stuff for online because you can feel the emotion with people. And like, that's what we do. The reason we make music and art, I think, is for people to really enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? And like, if I can't see people enjoying it, then it's like, it's theoretical. Like you might be enjoying it. I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what right. I mean? At a concert, there they are. They're right there having a good time. It's great. Right. And that fee, oh, go ahead, Josh. Were you about to say something? Oh, no, I wasn't going to say anything. Oh, what, what? But with, uh, yeah, uh, that also feeds back into what we were talking about earlier, like with uh, technology versus tangibility. And yeah, you know, um, just an Instagram like and the little heart, you know, that's great. But, you know, like you said, you, you can't really replicate that feeling of being there and just seeing people's faces and hearing people react to your work. You know, that's, that's something, like I said, that tangibility, that person to person interaction is something that you just can't beat you know and uh yeah man we really uh appreciate you for coming out honestly you know we think uh you know you're an awesome artist man and for you to be able to reach as many people as you as you have with you know your works of art and you know your uh, businesses and you know your programs it's it's amazing you know it's really uh it's really inspiring stuff seriously thank you for that. yeah thank you for that. and I, like i <clears throat> i've really enjoyed talking to you about this stuff as well because i guess like you know having the opportunity to sort of explain a bit more about what's behind it i think you know i i think for all of us it's nice if people enjoy it regardless do you know do you know what i mean but to have an opportunity to sort of say a bit more about the behind the scenes stuff is great as well a really good opportunity thank you um, oh yeah uh, okay marcus I was joking with them last week. I was like, you know, I'm I'm so psyched about the next podcast because I get to talk to somebody who like minded and who could talk about art and film. Because last week it was science, so I was the you know, eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just just to hear you talking stuff is just like finally, you know, a language I can understand and relate. To. But like I, like I said, I think it's real cool what you're doing, man. Because I've always loved that, you know and film and music like all come together in like their different ways and it's just it's amazing to actually talk to somebody who's doing all of that so I, it's really an honor you know to finally meet somebody you know physically well not physically but you know like we can now so yeah, i man. really enjoyed this thanks it's been a pleasure definitely uh, so yeah, uh, Ben. Is there anything you would like to talk about uh, before we uh, wrap up? Like any future pro uh, projects, anything dealing with your your companies? Like anything you want to tell our listeners out there? Yeah, I mean, I've got <clears throat> I've got a couple of my, my big dream before COVID happened was to I was going to come to LA with my show reel and start. To, I would love to work on a game. You know, like I'm a I love gaming. I, I kind of have to. I have to restrict myself because I get a bit too into it, but I love it. Uh -huh. To work on a game or a film, I've got, I'm writing a couple of different treatments for movies. Um, I've got a new show reel. I was going to come to LA and start kind of doing some more of that stuff. Um, but really like, I guess, you know, just the two things I'll say finally, one is that talking about tangibility and stuff like that, I think that we have to remember that all of us being separate like this for five or six months, it's had like a psychological effect on everyone. And like, I can't wait to be back in rooms with people. You know, I, I miss just like, you know, handshakes and hugs and, you know, yes, people yeah. enjoying themselves. It's like, I think we shouldn't underestimate how much of a, a, a like psychological toll that's taking. Um, but also it's like, um, I think talking about science and science and art, I think people really, re, people really separate them. Like artists are like scientists over there and scientists are like, I don't understand why art exists, you know, but actually, <laughs> all of the best things for me come from where people put those things together. Do you know what I mean? They, they sort of understand each other and use, you know, use 
you know you can get lo a lot of inspiration for science from science fiction which is an art yes. that's, that's yes. a lot of i love it um so yeah the more that people put those things together the better you know i love i love to kind of just uh, just be curious about the world that's awesome, man. That's that's very, very awesome. Um, just uh, just because uh, you know you said you're in the game, and uh, and as far as science fiction is concerned, have you played that uh, Last of Us two yet? I'm just going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> that game is amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's so it's good. Really I'm good. up to. I'm up. To, where am I up to? I'm like one hour into it or something like that. Two hours. But I got. I have to say, I love the Last of Us. It's so good. But yeah. the pull of yeah. playing Warzone. I'm like, do I play this like thoughtful, like thoughtful, considerate thing, or do I go and just kill loads of people in war zone? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> I, had, I, you know, I, had, I had to stop playing war zone because it was too fun. And I've been playing Infinite Warfare and Titanfall and stuff. But like, uh, yeah, oh, wow. Last, The Last of Us is brilliant because it's so accessible for everyone. Like it's a very, you know, even if you don't game at all, it's still a, an amazing experience, which is so cool. Definitely, definitely. And we all we all feel the same way. You know, we're all uh, a bunch of nerds here at the Square Round Table. We're all gamers. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, like, The Last of Us, it'd be having you in your feels, too. Like, because the story's so good, you get connected. Like, yeah. when stuff happens, you'd be like, oh, man, I, I knew it was going to happen, but dang. <laughs> Especially in the first one. The first one, the ending, the first one had me just oh. emotional. I was just like, man. Do I gotta make a choice? Do I, can I just not? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, but yes, guys. You know, uh, Ben, Mr. Ben Ditto. It has been nothing but a pleasure having you on, yes. man. Uh, like, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank yeah, you, man. definitely. And next time, Dang. you know, when when COVID is over and stuff, man, and you can finally travel again, make make sure you come, you know, down here to Georgia because you know we the, the the Southern Hollywood now, so. Y'all come check us out a little bit, man. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. And all right, guys. Uh, yeah, and this has been the Square Roundtable. Uh, everybody go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves. Once again, my name is Chad Singleton. D. My name is Josh Singleton. I'm Marcus. I'm Dane Ditto. All right, guys, this has been the Square Roundtable. And uh, yeah, time for my uh, promotion. So yeah, definitely for all of our uh, viewers on uh, YouTube, definitely uh, comment, subscribe, you know, uh, tell us about some of your, you know, favorite artists, you know, tell us about what you thought about Ben Ditto. Uh, yeah, just, you know, we want to hear your feedback. And for everybody on Power 214, uh, thank you for listening in. And you can catch us every Friday on power214.com at uh, 10 to 11 Pacific time, uh, 12 to 1 Eastern, uh, 12 to 1 Central time, and 1 to 2 Eastern time. And once again, everybody, this has been the Square Roundtable. Peace. Peace.